Uh, it's a great honour to be um, here with you this morning speaking um, with Australia's leading agricultural economists, policy makers and sector leaders. While I've grown up in regional North Queensland and my family has an Angus beef um, cattle business in Bathurst, New South Wales, I'm not going to present myself today as an agricultural economist or a proper farmer. Today I'll be sharing my perspectives on the future of Australia's agricultural trade and investment relationship with Asia and I'll be drawing on 10 years of living and working in China between 2001 and 2011 and since 2012 I've been back in Australia running, Australia, running KPMG Australia's Asia and international markets business which means that I have responsibility for looking after about a thousand Japanese, Chinese, Indian, Korean and Asian clients that are operating in Australia and it gives me the great pleasure of travelling back and forth to Asia about uh, eight to ten times per year, advising on major inbound investments and also trade projects. Given the time limitations uh, that we face this morning, I've, I've written a, a longer form report which will be posted onto the uh, ABES conference site after this. Let's be very clear-eyed and pragmatic about Asia. Australia's agricultural future is now well and truly connected to Asian markets and will remain so for many decades, if not forever. In 2015, eight out of the top 10 agricultural export markets for Australia were in Asia, including China as the largest, followed by Japan third, Indonesia fourth, and South Korea fifth. And over 60% of our agricultural exports go to these Asian countries now and most are covered by FTAs. Demographics and rising economic wealth will continue to underwrite Australia's very bright food sector opportunities with Asia. By 2050, the Earth's population is projected to reach over 9 billion. That's another 1.4 billion from where it is now. And based on my maths, it, it equates to adding 1.8 times Australia's current population every year over the next 32 years. Of that 9 billion, about 5.5 billion will be living in Asia on our doorstep. So India, China and ASEAN will be the key drivers for our, for our um, business. ANZ predicts that 85% of the growth in the world's middle class income will come from Asia. The FAO predicts that food supply will need to increase by over 60 per cent to meet this global demand. Yet the OECD predicts a slowdown in the growth of agricultural production in Asia. While self-sufficiency is a core goal for most Asian governments, it's, it's, a, um, it's not, a, not a possibility except for um, core staple products including rice. So to meet the, the local demand imports will have to dramatically increase and Australia is extremely well positioned to benefit from this. Competition is building quickly though, we can't take anything for granted. For example, Brazil gained access to China's meat market in May 2015 and by December 2015 its exports had surpassed Australia's. There is new competition emerging from new areas. For example, Russian and Ukrainian producers are pushing east uh, into, into China and will be doing so even more with the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Apologise to my uh, friends from the um, Meat Council and the Dairy Council on this photo, but uh, Australia's competitive advantage is clearly in two areas, producing clean, green, healthy food that's fresh and high quality and it's delivered just in time given our geographic proximity. There's another emerging driver that we may not have thought about though. Australia is becoming a very popular destination for wealthy inbound tourists from China where we received 1.5 million last year as well as India and other Asian nations. These guests are coming to Australia and enjoying our beautiful food and wine and going back to their home countries and wanting to buy more through conventional trade, through e-commerce or through the um, unofficial Daigao uh, relationships. So 
So where is the current state of our food exports? <clears throat> and I think I'm just rehashing what Steve said before. Um, our exports have been valued at about 45 billion. They've grown quite well, and they're forecast to hit about 49 billion uh, in the next year. The green line shows that agribusiness remains a very important part of Australia's economy. And I've made the link to tourism, which is the blue line, which is absolutely exploding at the moment. The NFF predicts the value of Australia's agricultural sector will grow to $100 billion in the next 15 years. And I put it to you that achieving this sort of success means that we actually have to succeed in key Asian markets. Let's also look at our agricultural export outlook. Based on ABARES statistics, this is the forecast for Australian agricultural exports to 2022. Despite the hard work of over 90,000 Australian farming companies and industry participants, these forecast statistics show that we are not making enough ground fast enough to be a major competitor in the Asian food game. These are hardly aggressive or ambitious growth numbers and we need to ask ourselves some questions. And in the Asian context, why? Is there a fundamental lack of understanding, know-how and relationships with Asian counterparties? Is it because of the complexity and difficulties of exporting products to some of these Asian countries where technical non-tariff barriers keep emerging and challenging our, our growth ambitions? Or is it more to do with our supply side? Is it because our production and processing lacks the scale to meet the increasing demands of Asian consumers? Is it because that we have underinvested in rural regional infrastructure, both transport and water, and we're now faced with higher export costs and slower delivery of our perishable food products? Or even worse, is there complacency about Australia's assumed right to become the food bowl or the deli of Asian food. Despite doing a lot of things very well, and I mean that, I personally believe that all of these factors are influencing Australia's agricultural success in Asia. There's a great opportunity in this conference to discuss them further and uh, for us to all have the shared goal of achieving $100 billion in 15 years. Before we start thinking about how to solve, uh, let's revisit some of the key statistics for high growth markets, China, Indonesia, and I'll also comment briefly on India. China is still the biggest market, the big game, and therefore we must continue to be our major country focus for driving food exports in Asia. The OECD estimates that China will overtake the United States as the largest middle income country in the world by 2020. And this rise in agricultural food consumption will be driven by continuing urbanisation of the Chinese population. Urban Chinese incomes are at least three times higher than rural incomes, and the percentage of the population living in urban areas has increased from 44% in 2006 to 57% in 2016. And that's the blue, um, blue line at the top graph. China is not one market. Shanghai has a population of 34 million, Guangzhou, Beijing and Shenzhen each 25 million, Wuhan 19 million, Chengdu 14 million. Each of these are very distinct food markets for Australian exports. China itself is a leading agricultural producer of course and has set out in 2016 an intent to be 95% self-sufficient in wheat, cereal and rice but it will have to continue to import very large quantities of meat, dairy, vegetables, fruit and wine. It will need to work with foreign companies to modernise its agricultural sector and also to address major water and soil pollution issues. Indonesia's rising middle class offers also enormous potential to Australia. And I note that tomorrow morning there'll be another special guest who'll be talking in detail about Indonesia. Uh, but its population again has grown from 265 million and will reach 322 million by 2050. It's got a young population, over half of them are aged under 30, and they're increasingly urban as well. 
Boston Consulting Group estimates that the middle and affluent classes, which currently uh, uh, amount to uh, about 75 million individuals, will rise to 140 million by 2020. Australia is in a very strong position to capitalise given our geographic proximity and I would say very strong government relations, stronger than it's been for a long time. In 2017, the Australians were, Australians were the uh, second largest exporter of agricultural products to Indonesia. We supplied about two and a half billion and were the largest supplier of beef to Indonesia. That's just the beginning. Imports of beef are projected to reach 26 billion by 2050, and that's up from half a billion in 2009. It's staggering growth. Imports of fruit and vegetables are expected to increase by almost 25 billion and 11 billion respectively between 2009 and 2050. Given a largely Muslim population, halal certification is a critically important uh, standard which is being strictly enforced by Indonesian food authorities, including against foreign companies. One of the primary goals for Indonesia is to strengthen its own food manufacturing sector and to create jobs for its young and unskilled uh, Indonesian workers. So therefore their government in negotiations around the Indonesia-Australia Free Trade Agreement is very keen on seeing Australia-Indonesian joint ventures for food manufacturing and packaging in Indonesia, leveraging that low-cost um, em uh, employee base and packaging halal certified food for domestic Indonesian consumption and also for exports to ASEAN. This creates enormous opportunities, but um, as we all know, Indonesia is a very difficult market uh, for foreign companies to succeed in. Uh, business cultures and business practices are very, very different. I'll comment briefly on India, uh, because it receives a lot of interest because of its very large 1.3 billion population and it's growing very quickly. I don't see Indian, India as a high growth agricultural market uh, for the near or medium term. The government continues to play a major role in the development uh, and the operation of the agricultural economy in India and it sets, continues to set high import tariffs, which is the reason why India-Australia uh, Free Trade Agreement uh, negotiations have stalled. But it's the largest dairy sector um, market in, in Asia. Uh, it will hit uh, 95 billion by 2050, 95 billion, and uh, therefore dairy has to be uh, focused on India over the long term. Other than that, Australian sheep meat and goat meat has massive potential in India if tariff agreements can be negotiated. And as India is the largest uh, cotton and wool spinning weaving uh, producer in the world, um, it also offers an enormous opportunity for Australian cotton and wool. Okay, so I think we've established now the, the size of the, of the opportunity. Nothing's changed, it's only getting bigger every time we come to these conferences. Uh, but they're also very diffi difficult markets to succeed in. We have to raise um, some serious questions though. What more can Australian governments, industry bodies, producers and exporters do to increase our trade exports? On the screen is a photo of the front cover of a report that KPMG and the University of Sydney released in 2013, um, where we tried to explain and research what was happening in Chinese investment trends in Australia. Uh, what became obvious when researching the report, though, uh, was that there's some really major issues, both perceived and real, that are confronting Australia's ability to engage with China and Asia more generally. And I'll go through a few of these, and I don't think they'll be any great surprise. There's a high level of concern in our society and our media about food security, about foreign land ownership, water usage, and increasingly wariness of Chinese investment. Australian farmers, especially farmers from smaller family holdings, are rapidly ageing, and younger generations of farmers aren't coming through in sufficient numbers. Profit margins are being negatively impacted by selling to domestic retailers, while farmers are facing ever higher energy, labour and regulatory costs. There's a need for further investment in rural regional infrastructure to enable greater scale, speed and productivity to meet the demands of Asian consumption. And there's genuine interest from foreign companies to continue to invest, and Australian farming companies generally welcome Chinese and Asian investment, 
as a source of capital for growth or as a complete exit opportunity. Those were the issues in 2013 and I think those are the issues in 2018. As Minister Littleproud had pointed out though, since that time there's been some really breakthrough um, developments in Australian agri uh, in the terms of free trade agreements, uh, white policy papers on agricultural competitiveness and the Northern Australian project and also the emergence of China's Belt and Road Initiative. And I want to link those issues to some of the big picture issues that are facing Australian agri and, and, and connect them with uh, Asian trade. Firstly, regards to free trade agreements, we now have fantastic trade agreement infrastructure. The federal government has delivered on crucially important bilateral free trade agreements with China, Japan and South Korea. And Minister Chobo has continued to pursue valuable bilateral FTAs, concluding an FTA with Singapore, which is an important food export market in itself, and also a great platform for ASEAN and Japanese exports. The government has also commenced negotiations with Hong Kong, which again is an important platform to enter the Chinese market, and it's continuing its negotiations with Indonesia. The Indonesia agreement uh, was originally hoped to be signed uh, late last year and it's, it's continuing and, and, and believe you me, it's largely around agricultural access. As I mentioned, India, there's no change in, in, in sight and present for negotiations with that free trade agreement and trade exports, uh, bilateral trade stalled at about 20, uh, 20 billion. In addition to those bilateral ones, Australia is pursuing multilateral free trade agreements uh, with uh, TPP-11 uh, and the ASEAN-led RCEP. TPP-11 will be um, signed in, the, um, in Chile uh, this month. Very exciting, lots of opportunities for, for Australian farmers in terms of increased volumes and also I understand great access for dairy and wheat into Japan. It looks as though the USA will not be in the uh, initial stages of um, TPP, <clears throat> but um, that in fact might play into Australia's advantages. The Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership <clears throat> has been under negotiation for about um, six years and 22 rounds and India and China at the moment are, are uh, holding up in terms of their um, negotiating strategies. Uh, it's an important opportunity for Australia given that 65% uh, of our total goods and services are in the uh, RCEP area. It's great to have the free trade agreements but how well are Australian SMEs really using them? Last week, Minister Chobo revealed that DFAT and PwC had released an FTA utilisation report showing that 77% of large Australian enterprises uh, and 55% of small and medium-sized enterprises are now using the FTAs. A survey by the Economist Intelligence Unit in 2015 showed that Australia's FTA usage rate was only 19%. So it's very positive to see, based on, on those numbers and the reports that have been issued, that utilisation rates are, are improving for Australian companies, uh, although there's still work to do for SMEs. There's no doubt a lot of complexity in navigating through these noodle bowls of, of opportunities uh, in FTAs. And KPMG has launched Access Asia in the last year, which is a comprehensive trade consulting services business which is designed to help medium-sized uh, Australian food and, and uh, manufacturing companies to understand the full range of opportunities afforded by the free trade agreements, uh, to, to design the appropriate market entry and growth strategy to find the right supply chain partners and distribution partners in Asia, and also to take full advantage of the tariff cuts and the uh, government incentives and grants. So I'd be more than happy to talk with any of you after this about uh, what's happening with Access Asia. The second major breakthrough has been in the Agricultural Competitiveness White Paper and the Minister has, has talked a lot about that. One of the major opportunities uh, for us is to speed up and lower the cost of our delivery of perishable food uh, to Asian consumer markets. That's one of our greatest uh, current uh, advantages and we have some work to do. Um, from farm gate to destination, transport costs currently account for between 21 and 48 per cent of, of total farm gate value. 
By 2030, total domestic freight will increase by 70 to 80 per cent, and that will mean approximately 300,000 more trucks on Australian roads. It's not sustainable. Other than the inland rail link and the Western Sydney Airport freight precinct, which have been announced but not yet built, Australia lacks a coordinated, comprehensive and funded solution for regional infrastructure to improve the efficiency of food, export, transport, logistics. Back in the 1990s, the Inland Marketing Corporation, based in the city of Parks, a key road and rail junction in the central heartland of New South Wales, developed a visionary plan to create a cold chain logistics airport hub to air freight large quantities of fresh perishable produce overnight to supermarkets in Asia. The project at that time failed to get the necessary government funding and so perishable food still goes on trucks to Sydney and then on to underbelly passenger air freight to Asian markets where it has much shorter shelf time. Projects of this nature and size should now be privately financed, including with foreign and Asian capital and construction expertise. And it's positive to see the Toowoomba Air Freight Hub built. We need to see more vision and more investment of this type to really drive our food sector's growth into Asia. The Northern Australian White Paper um, was very important in terms of recognising, um, going back to Steve's map before, that Australia at the moment limits its farming to, to a very narrow corridor on both the east and the west coast, and there's enormous opportunity to open up a quarter of the northern Australian land area and to boost by 20% Australia's total land under irrigation. Clearly that irrigated farmland could play an important role in increasingly uh, increasing our food exports to Asia. And again, Australia needs a coordinated, comprehensive and funded water solution for capturing and wa moving water from very high rainfall areas to further south to enable our um, food producers to grow new crops and products that Asian consumers want on a much larger scale and very reliably and less subject to drought like what we had during the millennium drought. The timing is good for this. Northern Australia Infrastructure Program could be tied nicely into the Belt and Road Initiative. Belt and Road is a signature project of China's president, long-term president now, Xi Jinping, and is being rolled out across Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, North Africa and East Europe. <clears throat> Australians, I don't think, pay enough attention to Belt and Road and the opportunities or the risks that it could bring to us. Chinese road and rail construction companies like John Holland's parent company, CCCI, could help deliver major transport, energy and water infrastructure projects in northern Australia. Some of the other challenges that we face um, in researching this paper, uh, technical non-tariff barriers appear to be one of the biggest growth limitation issues that Australian companies and industry groups are facing with regards to Asian markets, particularly China, Malaysia and Indonesia. Both the red meat and dairy industries have undertaken independent studies in 2017 on the opportunity costs of technical non-tariff barriers. For red meat, it was estimated to be costing 3.3 billion Australian dollars and for dairy, 1.57 billion. Uh, these are opportunity costs. Since then, seafood and other sectors have also undertaken similar studies. <clears throat> These sorts of problems I recognise are very difficult for our governments to solve because they, by their nature, are behind the borders of other countries. Uh, but our, our SME exporters need experienced and practical assistance from the Department of Agriculture, Austrade and other state governments to help solve non-tariff issues in developing Asian markets where language and cultural issues are very different. Another major challenge for Australia to get over um, is our negative attitudes to um, foreign and Chinese investment. And unfortunately, public Australian attitudes are becoming even less supportive of foreign investment in agricultural land. The 2016 Lowe Institute poll found that 87% of the 1,200 people surveyed were against foreign investment, and that's up 6% on the previous uh, poll. Australians are concerned about ownership of Australian agricultural land domestic food security, and the future pricing of our food. That's fair and it's reasonable and it's the same in New Zealand. 
Foreign investment regulations uh, through FERB have been tightened recently for agribusiness and land, and so there's greater rigour to investment proposals. But we need less emotion and more facts. And fortunately, one of the great things in the last couple of years, again, is some facts. The federal government has delivered on its commitment to create a foreign ownership register, which shows that 88% of Australian farmland is Australian owned, wholly Australian owned, and 80% of agricultural water entitlements is wholly Australian owned. It's important to note that beyond the primary um, food production sector, um, over the last 100 years, many foreign companies have come to Australia with long-term vision and capital from the UK, from the USA, from the Netherlands, from Japan, Brazil and Singapore, and they've invested in the largest Australian food companies up the value chain. So while we have a lot of focus on agricultural land, we also need to pay some attention to up the value chain where they really control uh, the distribution and the pricing. KPMG and the University of Sydney have continued to update our data on Chinese investment and I'm pleased to announce at this conference, uh, based on our statistics, that in 2017 approximately $1.37 billion of additional Chinese investment was received uh, in the year which brings the total accumulated Chinese investment in Australia to $4.2 billion. So in conclusion, how should Australia adapt to its current issues and challenges and compete in the Asian market? Well, that's really the, the discussion for this conference, but a few ideas. Um, firstly, a national brand is required. We need a national brand uh, which captures the imagination and the tastes of our Asian consumers. We need consistent and clear messaging uh, in a comprehensive way to support the image of Australia's high quality healthy products. Um, it may sound trivial, but it works very well. Um, believe me, with, um, with Fonterra and, and uh, Zespri kiwi fruit in New Zealand, they've done very, very well as a result. And it's very positive to see our uh, red meat industry releasing their true Aussie lamb, beef and goat brand for Asia. And see, also to see that Austrade are taking the lead on developing a national, national brand. We need to increase productivity and cut through red tape. And one of the key areas is, is through blockchain technology for a single window of trade information and platform while preserving our biosecurity regulations. And I'm sure that will come up in, in the conversations over the next couple of days. We need to encourage further foreign investment in our food and infrastructure sector, but based on clear and consistent terms. In cases where Australia cannot or will not provide the domestic capital needed to support and grow modern large scale farming, Foreign capital can help boost production, deliver infrastructure, create jobs and lift the economy. And while there are some valid concerns about Chinese investment in Australia, the economic benefits should not be underestimated in terms of increased trade and economic activity, particularly with China, and nor should we take these for granted. Meanwhile, Asian investors need to build their knowledge and awareness of farming in Australia and build a deep and genuinely trustful relationship with local Australian partners, communities and governments. Beyond capital and offtake, Australian farmers and communities want to work with foreign investors who are committed for the long term, who are experienced in farming and investing, who can communicate their issues early and who understand and respect the natural, nat natural environment and our local communities. So in summary, <clears throat> Asia remains a massive long-term opportunity, but international competition is building rapidly from traditional and also new players through Belt and Road. Multilateral free trade agreements are coming online. We've got our existing free trade agreements which we need to ensure are fully utilised, and that requires a big um, educational journey. Australian fresh, fresh premium food is well known and respected by Asian importers and consumers, but with a fresh and exciting national brand, greater in-market support to resolve non-tariff issues and more effective utilisation of FTAs by SME exporters, I believe that we can seek to achieve NFF's goal of a $100 billion export. 
Our proximity to ASEAN and major Asian markets is a clear competitive advantage for Australia. However, we need to quite urgently fix some of our own supply side issues by building greater production scale, building and upgrading rural regional transport and water infrastructure, and delivering fresh, high quality food faster than our competition. We also need to recognise the market power is now in Asian consumers' hands. We need to change our negative attitudes towards Asian foreign investment. We need to work skillfully and respectfully with Asian government regulators on resolving tariff and non-tariff matters. And we need to pragmatically build new language and cultural skills to enable relationships that can sustain the growth we want to achieve in partnership with Asia. Thank you very much.